I was scared because I didn't know if he was dead or alive. And thankfully, he was crying, and that's how I was able to find him, was by listening, following to his cry. May 16th, 2025. London, Kentucky. Tara Holyfield was awake in her bed while her almost two-year-old son, Parker, was in his own room sleeping. She knew the weather was bad, but she had no cell service. So, she had no way of knowing just how bad it could be. A thought that was keeping her awake. But surely, it couldn't be that serious, right? London, Kentucky isn't one to be devastated by fierce tornadoes, after all. Yet, unbeknownst to Tara and to the rest of the Sunshine Hills subdivision in London, Kentucky, a powerful tornado had landed in Russell County an hour prior, and it was picking up speed directly toward their home. The only warning hinting at its arrival was the loud freight train-like sounds outside. Hearing this ominous rumble, Tara ran to grab her son from his room, but before she could, the tornado lifted both of them up away from their house. And when they landed, their house was gone. They were surrounded by rubble, and their entire community just disappeared from the map. Tara, injured, rushed to find her son amongst the chaos and debris. Luckily, she found him alive, crying. But unfortunately, this wasn't the case for everyone. I'm definitely going to be more weather aware from now on in hopes that, you know, this doesn't happen again. Yeah, it's just been a very scary. It may sound strange to hear of stories of people being unprepared for tornadoes. Some say that that could never be them, thinking they'll immediately be prepared even at the slightest chance of a tornado touching down near their home. This is something that you see, see and hear about, but you never think it will happen to you. We we have nothing you now. Everything's gone. But the truth is, most people, except those living in Tornado Alley, don't really expect such violent tornadoes to touch down even during storm season. And residents of eastern Kentucky, for the most part, are among the laid-back population that doesn't really expect deadly twisters. See, Kentucky may be part of the Dixie Alley, which you can think of as a secondary tornado hotspot in the United States. But those who live in London, Kentucky, and nearby areas, know that their part of the state still isn't in that much risk of violent storms. Only about 20 tornadoes occur in Kentucky annually, and most of those are EF-0s and EF-1s, barely damaging fences and snapping branches. And in very rare instances of disastrous and violent twisters in the state, the western side often pulls the short end of the straw, experiencing the bulk of the strongest tornado activity. No wonder people in eastern Kentucky, like Tara Holyfield, didn't pay much mind to the weather on May 16th, even when this storm was already forecasted days prior. On May 12th, 2025, the Storm Prediction Center issued its Day 4 Severe Weather Outlook, highlighting parts of the Ohio Valley under a 15% severe weather risk. As the event drew closer, so did the risks and possibilities of significant damage. By May 15th, just one day before the storm, the Day 2 outlook was upgraded to a moderate risk, with forecasters warning of a regional outbreak of severe thunderstorms. Intense supercells capable of large hail and tornadoes were mentioned followed by an overnight Boeing line of storms with damaging winds. At that stage, a 10% tornado probability was placed over most of Kentucky. We have a big problem tomorrow. We have lines of storms moving in from the west to the east as early as 4 o'clock in our western counties. I really think prime time is 6 to 10 tomorrow. It's clear, however, that the expected tornado-prone area slightly missed London. And this likely further contributed to why many of those living in the city didn't take this outlook seriously. The next day, or D-Day, May 16th, 2025. The Day 1 outlook was issued at 7.46 a.m. Once again, a moderate risk was declared. This time, the probabilities of violent tornadoes capable of EF2 or EF5 damage had jumped to 15%. 
There was also a 45% chance of strong, damaging winds and 45% of hail coming from the storm. Based on the survivors' accounts, though, these outlooks pretty much meant nothing to the regular residents. They knew that if things got really bad, the sirens would blare, severe weather news would pop up, and their friends would likely warn them, understandable. But when people go about their day thinking the weather isn't too threatening and hit the sheets at night, not knowing that there could be a twisting midnight monster knocking on their doors, then that's when trouble can strike. That's exactly how the day went for people of Eastern Kentucky on May 16th, 2025. It was like any other regular Friday. Schools were open, parents headed to work as usual, and cinema theaters were packed even an hour before midnight. On the flip side, meteorologists were keeping a close eye on the skies. Dew points hovered near the 70s, which meant the atmosphere was loaded with moisture and instability. Strong winds aloft provided the wind shear needed to rotate supercells, and a passing cold front supplied the lift to spark storms. As evening came, a powerful low-level jet entered the region, adding the final spin for violent tornadoes. By 10 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, a supercell was marching toward Jamestown in Russell County. And by 10.27 p.m., when most were asleep or in bed, the tornado that would later track through three states for an hour and a half, killing 19 people and injuring over 100, eventually touched down in Russell County, northeast of Jamestown. And as soon as we got in there and I grabbed the kids and we went down, I mean, it, it happened that quick. I don't, I don't know how they lived. If you look at his house, I guess that's something to be thankful for. That was my apartment. And uh, we dug ourselves out, out of this between that washing machine and that refrigerator. Initially, the twister resembled a typical Kentucky tornado, producing minor damage to outbuildings and snapping a few trees along Kentucky 619. Some hillsides were grazed, debris and branches were scattered, and some homes sustained minor roof damage. If you were indoors, you would have thought it was just the strong winds that were warned about by the National Weather Service. But as the tornado moved east-northeastward, it gradually strengthened to EF2. Winds reaching up to 135 miles per hour tore through the countryside, destroying mobile homes and a camper. They might not have seen the funnel, but people were starting to feel firsthand that this was a tornado. The twister continued its path, and as it crossed Gosser Ridge Road and damaged homes along the way, it had strengthened to low-end EF3. Now, winds are reaching upward of 140 miles per hour. Shortly after, the tornado approached the outskirts of Pulaski County. In Pulaski, the twister alternated between EF3, EF2, and EF1 winds, shrinking and widening as it tracked from the western hills near House Fork Creek to the southern side of Somerset. But regardless of its strength, it had one common trait throughout, its hunger for damage. It caused notable destruction in every minute of its lifetime. Farmsteads were battered, roofs were ripped from homes, barns were destroyed, and outbuildings were flattened. It's hard to see. Homes that are in a single wall left standing. Some homes that have all four walls yet lost the person inside. Soon, it inched toward its worst hit in the country, Somerset proper. Immediately, the tornado destroyed two homes and damaged several others with heavy roof and wall damage. Vehicles weren't spared from the debris-filled winds either. The Somerset Cinema's 8 building was hit directly. At the time, about 100 people were still inside, enjoying a movie. Luckily, the building only took minor roof and structural damage. Nearby, along Parker's Mill Way, a strip mall was badly damaged as well. Most of the windows were blown out, and debris scattered all across the parking lot. The Pulaski County Area Technology Center collapsed completely, 
and the nearby Redeemer Lutheran Church had its front and back walls torn down. Businesses like Baxter's Coffee, Speedway, and South Central Bank, places central to people's day-to-day -day lives, were unrecognizable. And the independent opportunities community HAB, which provided rehabilitation services to people with developmental disabilities, was also flattened. For the next several minutes, the, the tornado stayed in the county of Pulaski. More buildings, homes, and businesses were ravaged. In the Somerset area alone, more than a dozen homes and 20 businesses were destroyed. And as the powerful tornado left the residential areas of the county, it moved the Daniel Boone National Forest, where it solidified its EF3 strength. Satellite images and drone footage clearly show how the twister scarred the otherwise lush greenery of this national forest. The scars showcase how the tornado grew in size as it uprooted and snapped trees just before it passed north of the community of Poplarville along Kentucky 3269. Poplarville is where the tornado caused its first ever EF4 damage. Here, a concrete home where an elderly couple and their family friend took shelter was leveled. Two survived, but unfortunately, the 69-year-old wife died when she was lifted by the tornado and struck by flying debris. Later, she was found in the yard of her home. I don't know what they're going through. I really don't. I don't, I don't know what they're thinking. I don't know that if they know that it's just real yet or if everything has come to terms for them. I, I don't know. The tornado damaged more outbuildings before it once again weakened to EF2 as it moved eastward. However, as if trees feed off this tornado's energy, the twister quickly regained EF3 intensity after uprooting and mowing down swaths of softwood trees in its path. Using these trees as damage indicators, surveyors estimate that the winds were likely as strong as 153 miles per hour at this point. Strong but it has yet to reach its full potential. The tornado continued its destructive path through trees, and as it crossed Kentucky 1003, it reached its maximum width of nearly one mile, just before it stepped into Laurel County. This is where the tornado left its deadliest tracks. But it wouldn't start off as fatal. In fact, the tornado first weakened during its first few moments in Laurel County. As the tornado entered the Laurel Canyon subdivision, homes lost their roofs, exterior walls were knocked down, and power poles were snapped. But that's pretty much it. It was back to EF1 intensity. Unfortunately though, like it had done a handful of times throughout its lifetime, the tornado was still due for another ramp up. Along Hart Church Road, the tornado stole the life of a 47-year-old woman. Next, it tore through Lovelace Subdivision, where homes were thrown, a tractor trailer was flipped on its side, and an elderly couple was killed. The next stop, Sunshine Hills in London, was the most deadly. Since the tornado maintained high-end EF3 intensity throughout this neighborhood, every home it touched was reduced to debris. Three homes were completely swept away by the wind, concrete slabs were lifted and cracked, and mobile homes were flattened. While Tara Holyfield and her son survived in this subdivision, nine lives were lost in Sunshine Hills alone. Crossing Walker Lane, three more homes were demolished by the rampaging twister. Along Boone Trail, houses were also swept away, and another person was killed. In subdivisions around Philpot Road and Airview Drive, the horror continued, with homes being damaged and destroyed from all directions. One poorly built house was swept off its foundation. Two elderly siblings were killed when their home collapsed. Mobile homes in the area were also obliterated. In each neighborhood, the damage looked the same. Roofs, gone. Walls, collapsed and debris scattered across yards and fields. The fatalities kept climbing with every community the Twister visited. At the London Corbin Airport, hangars and warehouses were destroyed by the strong winds. 
Several aircraft and a medical helicopter were also damaged and totaled. Nearby, a small neighborhood was impacted, and a manufacturing center collapsed, killing a 25-year-old man inside. CCTV cameras at the London Corbin Airport captured the exact moment the tornado tore through these buildings, except for the times the lightning flashes revealed the funnel, you can see just how dark it was during the time people had to survive in the middle of this storm. Still, the tornado was far from over. Along US-25, the tornado ripped through more businesses. A martial arts school was flattened, and a large apartment building collapsed, killing two people inside. Likewise, the south side florist was reduced to rubble, and a pet store was hit. Thankfully, all of the animals survived. From there, the tornado crossed more neighborhoods, damaging barns, snapping trees, and destroying outbuildings. It was weakening, but it was still producing EF2 and EF3 damage. A couple of warehouses were destroyed, and the Slate Hill Baptist Church was unroofed. Along Cedar Ridge, the tornado had finally lost its destructive strength. At this point, it could only shatter a few windows and snap trees prior to dissipating west of Lida. The tornado tracked a long 60-mile path just before midnight. At that point, it was on the ground for 90 minutes, and across three counties, it had killed 19 people and injured over 100. As the tornado left the ground around midnight, the people of Somerset in London were just starting to make sense of their new horrific reality. Survivors emerged from rubble and were surrounded by shouts for help amid the dark chaos. Some people had broken legs. Others were left completely paralyzed. One surviving couple in particular drew the attention of the media as they each lost an arm trying to hold on to each other while the tornado completely tore their home apart. A poetic testament of how the people of Kentucky endure tragedy, hanging on to each other. Unfortunately, while most survived unscathed or with minor injuries, there were others who weren't so lucky. Katie Byrne, one of the community heroes who immediately rushed to help neighbors, saw dead bodies of people and pets scattered near their home after the tragedy. It's so heartbreaking to hear about situations like this and, and see the tragic damage that people are dealing with. This traumatic and heart-wrenching sight would have been experienced by many others as well. Amid the devastation, though, the helping hand from the government and relief organizations sparked hope for the victims. Temporary shelters were immediately provided to victims. The Operation Barbecue Relief and Creek Church combined provided thousands of hot meals to survivors daily. Food banks received a $25,000 donation from Kroger. And Walmart's foundation, Sam's Club, also raised $750,000 for relief operations. Some looting mishaps occurred along the way when donated bags and necessities were stolen from a Kentucky trailer park. But the new donations poured in thereafter, so the help was not disrupted. We are going to be here for this community today, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, and in the years to come to help people rebuild. As the towns rebuilt and families began picking up the pieces of their memories, one question was often echoed by interviewers. Will the survivors still live here despite the destruction? Of course, no single answer can represent the experiences of all residents in Kentucky. But Getson Roberts, one of the survivors, shared his thoughts in a news interview. As far as rebuilding here in my community, I mean, this is our home. You know, this is where I work. This is this is our home. I'm, I plan on I plan on staying here. <laughs>